Welcome again to our services for Carmichael Baptist Church. We're going to be going back to our series, Bringing the Gospel to Mars Hill. This is actually the last message that we're going to have, although we could have done many, many more. The world is full of religion, but there's only one truth. That is the truth of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto God, to the Father, but by Him. In this message, we're going to be talking about atheism. The very name atheism means no God. They deny that a higher power exists at all. Or at least they would say we're totally disconnected from any type of God. But you know, at its heart, this is really idolatry, just as all the other false religions that we've looked at. The atheist is really worshiping the God of self. And sadly, this is growing more rapidly than any other false gospel. You see this chart I've got for you? That little red line is no religion. And you can see how it just goes up and up and up. This went up to about 2018, where it's pretty much even with, in our nation today with Catholicism and evangelical beliefs. When we look at a younger generation, we'd call the millennials, that goes up even more. The younger you get, the less uh, believing in God and focused on religion you become, according to the, all the polls. 36% of this younger generation have turned away from any ideas of God or religion. I think it's reasonable to think that in the next 20 years, this could surpass professing Christianity in our nation, much as it has throughout Europe and Asia. This definitely fits what the Apostle Paul told young Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.1, he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. He goes on to speak of these individuals in the last days that they would have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof from such turn away. And he says of them in verse 7, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But you know, no matter how dark things may become, we know the Lord is still shining the light of His gospel through us. And we understand and we trust that He has the power to save, regardless of who that person is that we're reaching out to. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. I would say much of the group that we're talking about today would be like those Greeks. They laugh off religion and God as foolishness for unlearned people. But look at verse 24. Unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, both those involved in, in false religion and those who say they have no religion, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God to everyone God will call through our witness. That's our hope. That's our assurance. So we're going to look into this sad frame of mind of atheism. We want to understand the corruption that leads to it, but we're doing this not to feel better about ourselves or to beat someone down. This is all about our spirits being stirred, being moved to prayer and outreach for this lost and dying world. Now, I've titled this Atheism, but I think a better title might be Secular Humanism. It's kind of a broader term. It essentially talks about a belief that's based on human ideas rather than God's revelation. Now that could be outright atheism that says there is no God. It could be a rationalism which says human reasoning and wisdom, not religion, is what should govern our lives. So essentially God doesn't matter. And then there's agnosticism which says, well, there might be a God, but man cannot know or understand Him. He's far removed from us. And we could mention a lot of other flavors, but the bottom line is that man puts himself in control of his own life, and he rejects all calling to seek after and to follow God. That's kind of at the heart of secular humanism. Now, when we're talking about influential individuals that are atheists or secular humanists, you can pretty much put them into two groups. There are the scientific group. 
these people fight against belief in God because they feel like it hinders scientific knowledge and breakthroughs. Religion keeps people in the dark ages. It holds them back from, from great advancements. Of course, Charles Darwin is very famous, very much at the forefront of this group because he based his evolutionary theory, his idea of life, developing uh, without a creator. He kind of just, life evolved, life happened, and that beca has become the basis for much of our scientific thought today. Richard Dawkins and Stephen Hawking are two recent scientists, very outspoken in their atheism. And we could certainly talk about many more. Sadly, the majority of the scientific community today falls into this category. You know, it should be pointed out, though, men who laid the groundwork for our modern understanding of the world, men like Galileo, men like Isaac Newton, they believed in God and they based their findings on his creative work. Something to think about there. The second group of outspoken atheists, though, we can call the humanist. This group feels like teaching God, teaching the teachings of religion, that it will corrupt the values of society. It makes men closed-minded. It makes men judgmental. Famous among this group is the philosopher Voltaire, who proclaimed every sensible, every honorable man must hold the Christian sect in horror. He was constantly at odds with the religious world, particularly the Christian world in Europe of his day. We could add the founder of communism, Karl Marx, who wrote that religion is the opium of the people. And if you look at the numbers, the statistics, communist countries today are a bastion of atheism. And then in our nation, Madeleine Murray O'Hare, founded the American Atheist, was very instrumental in a 1963 Supreme Court ruling that ended the Bible's reading in public schools. And so she was a very influential atheist in our own country. You know, we can mention just about everyone in Hollywood. And that's, that's a sad reality. Uh, there are many more we could talk about that are famous, that are outspoken in their atheism. But you know, this hits home much more when it's somebody you know. Somebody in your family. Someone in your workplace that holds to atheistic ideas. You know, I thought about three different conversations uh, this week that, that I've had in the past with atheistic individuals in my life. I remember a fellow student when we were in college talking with him and he just was adamant, science proves there cannot be a God. He kind of bought into all the atheistic teaching of the school and so had removed God out of his life because it was scientific. There's an individual at work that talked about all the catastrophes that had happened around us and said, why would a God allow so much evil to happen in this world. And that's often an excuse that people give. And then somebody in my own family that I witnessed to respond that I am not so proud to claim I know there is a God or who he or she is. Kind of an agnostic view there. But I would guess most of you have met someone who has talked in, in this way or, or a similar way. And it's sad, these individuals seem very convinced of their beliefs. But don't be deceived. This is not the testimony of greater learning or greater moral understanding. Let's talk about the real cause of atheism. And I think that comes out in 1 John chapter 2, and verse 15. It says there, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. The lust of the flesh, that's talking about the cravings of our bodies, the desires that we have within us. The lust of the eyes is to be trusting and living for only what you can see, what you can covet after that's in this world. And of course, the pride of life, that's to exalt and that is to glorify yourself in the eyes of men. And that pretty much sums up why these atheists, secular humanists, do not want God because God opposes all of these things. His law condemns our wicked desires. His truth reveals these worldly pleasures are just a mirage. 
and His glorious person will humble you to the dust and reveal your nothing without Him. Atheism isn't about science. It's not about the corruption of religion. It's a rebellion of man against God. It's a belief of fools. Now, I know that's a strong statement, but don't take that from me. Those aren't simply my words. Those are God's words. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Why would I say it's foolish, or why does God reveal it's foolish? Well, just a couple thoughts here. First of all, without God, there is no source of life. You know, the scientific atheistic community can talk all they want about a big bang, about a tiny particle of charged energy that exploded and caused the universe, but where did that particle come from? The very first law of thermodynamics says that energy can be neither created nor destroyed. So how did it begin? Looking just at the wonder of how things were, are made, about the intricate details that make up life, how it's able to exist, how it's able to thrive, it reveals a higher power. Psalm 19.1 puts it well. I don't have it for you on the screen, but it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. God is evident by the creation He made. You can only know Him in His Word, know Him fully, but the fact that He's there is revealed in the wonder of the creation that He's put around us. How sad that the greatest minds in our world today, the ones who dedicate their life to studying out this creation, deny the Creator. But then secondly, without God there is no purpose to life. You know, if we just came from a series of accidents, what else can our life be, our existence be, than just a continued series of accidents? Chaos reigns in everything that we do and in everything that we experience. And you know, if everything falls apart in your world, well, that's just what happens. That's how it goes. There's no happy ending, regardless doesn't matter what you accomplish. doesn't matter what you gain here. There's no happy ending because in the end you leave it all behind. This world is gone and death eventually finds you and all that you've done will be forgotten. You know, I can't imagine a more foolish and depressing philosophy. It's very much the mindset that depressed Solomon when he wrote Ecclesiastes, when he said, vanity of vanity, all is vanity, until he turned his mind to God. And that's when he found hope. Fear God. Keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. You take away God, boy, you've got a depressing life. You've got no purpose to life. But then thirdly, without God, there's no standard of morality. What is it that makes something right or wrong? Is it because of what society thinks? Because of what some person in the government thinks? Well, what gives them the right to judge me to determine that is right or wrong? Ultimately, a godless world leaves it up to the individual to decide what he thinks is good or evil. There are no absolutes. There's just ideas and there's just opinions and there's just philosophy. Of course, we understand there's a law that's written upon man's heart that has brought about all the true order in this world, and that's God's mercy. Man knows something is wrong. It's wrong to kill someone else. It's wrong to steal what is someone else's. Why? Because God put that law in the heart. The very conviction that man has over his sin, even unbelieving atheistic man, testifies that there is a God. Morality speaks of the God who has a moral law. Let's talk about reaching out. And let's go back to where we were at the beginning of the series. We're going to kind of circle round all the way back to the Apostle Paul there on Mars Hill. And I want to remind you, if you followed this series, he's preaching to the Epicureans. He's preaching to these philosophers, and they were essentially an early form of today's atheists. Yeah, there were, it was kind of a pantheistic society, and there on Mars Hill there were all these temples and all these gods, but the Epicureans kind of looked at it as just, you know, something that, makes people feel better. 
But they are, at their heart, atheists. Didn't really believe much in an afterlife. They even held to evolutionary ideas. Paul began to, to minister there, and this was kind of their response to them. Certain philosophers, in verse 18, of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and said, What will this babbler say? You know, that's kind of how you may get thought of when you're preaching the gospel. You're a babbler. You're, you're spouting foolishness in their sight. Others, some, he seemed to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. How does Paul respond? Does he get mad? No, he responded by preaching wholeheartedly the truth. Acts 17, 24 he stands and he proclaims there in Mars Hill, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. He's probably motioning to the temples that are behind him around Mars Hill. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone or graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. This was Paul's message to this group. First of all, it was a bold witness from the apostle. You know, the atheist is often an educated person. And their response is very often to, to your gospel is going to be condescending. I mean, that's just a reality we have to face. That was certainly the case at Mars Hill. They're calling Paul a babbler. But Paul's not embarrassed. He's not ashamed. He didn't care what these philosophers thought and about all their reason. Let them laugh if they wanted to. He knew in his heart this was the truth. Romans 1, verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also unto the Greek. We need to have that confidence in our witness. And that does not come from having the greatest education. That does not come from being the greatest debater. That comes from a close walk with the Lord. That comes from trusting His power having assurance in His truth, knowing you're His child, knowing He is your creator and sustainer, and one day He's going to accomplish His, all of, or every day He's going to accomplish His will and His purpose until the day He brings us home. Understanding the truths of that gospel will give you the boldness. And a young child can have that. A new believer can experience that boldness. They should. Secondly, this was a biblical witness. Acts 17, Paul proclaims a simple scriptural message that Jehovah is the creator and ruler and judge of all things. That he's revealed himself through the word and he's given hope of salvation through the gift of his son. You know, when you're reaching out to somebody, there's this temptation to try to, to debate with science or try to debate with reason and try to meet them where they are. But center your message on the scriptures. That's the foundation. That's what they need to hear. You're just going to kind of get yourself in an endless, meaningless debate if you try to use science. Although certainly science follows the Bible, the Bible's the core of what we believe, and that's what people need to hear. It's through the preaching of the gospel that God has promised to save sinners. And that's what Paul did. He preached the gospel. Thirdly, we need a burden witness. Back in Acts 17, verse 16, it says that while Paul waited at Athens for Timothy and for Silas, his spirit was stirred within him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. 
It wasn't a situation where Paul wanted to put these foolish men in their place. He wanted to be the, the, seen as the greater philosopher or the greater debater. No, his heart was breaking because he saw these people living without hope and purpose, blindly stumbling down this path to utter eternal destruction. And he had the only message that could save their souls. You know, if ever we're going to be an effective witness in this atheistic world around us, we need the same motivation. Lord, keep us from pride. This is not about me. This is not about winning the argument. This is about their need, and it's about God's glory. That's what matters. And when that's your desire, your witness is not going to remain silent. You're going to find the strength to reach out with God's truth. Finally, he was a believing witness. You know, nothing can seem so hopeless as reaching out to an avowed atheist with the gospel. You think all that's going to come from this is just a pointless argument or perhaps embarrassment. Well, if you're trusting your abilities, that might be true. Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 24, Again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And we could probably say it's easier for that, that camel going through the needle than an atheist to believe and to repent. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? Verse 26, Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I've said this before in the study that you could take somebody who grew up in church, who had all the truth of God, who even acknowledges God as real and has learned all the Bible. It's just as impossible for them to be saved through your witness as somebody who den utterly denies anything about God. Man in himself cannot be saved. You in and of yourself cannot save anybody. But God can save anyone He purposes. God will save every single one that He purposes. It's the Spirit that takes that simple gospel, maybe even spoken from a child, and touches the heart and saves the soul. There's not an atheist that's beyond God's power to save. Regardless, when you're a faithful witness... God's word never returns void. He's going to accomplish all that he pleases. Mars Hill's still out there. It's all around us. This is a world filled with idols and false beliefs. Some of them false religion in the name of Christianity. Some of them false religion that's very different from Christianity but worships these false gods. And then there's the, the idols of atheism that surround us. We've only scratched the surface in this study. But I tell you, as Mars Hill's out there, we can have this confidence, God's there also. God is at work through us. He's made us a light into this world. There's some that are going to mock, some are, that are going to get offended, but God's truth will shine forth. And He's going to use it. Oh, that our spirits might be stirred for that wondrous work. Help us to be faithful preaching the gospel at our Mars Hill. I pray this has been a blessing to you. It's been an encouragement to me to go through this study. Sad when we see the falsehood, the false religion, but wonderful to see our truth in light of it and wonderful to know God is using us in this world. I pray it's a blessing to you. Look forward to coming to you again and reaching out to you again as we get into a new series of the Psalms in the weeks coming up. Look forward to our pastor bringing a message here in a few minutes. May the Lord bless you.